The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite player and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three-pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the PrizePix community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here from my flagship station in Atlanta, Georgia, WSB, broadcasting across the nation. Delighted to have you with me. The phone number 877. 877- Nine seven three seven four two five. If you want to be on the program, although you have to wait, I have a guest now. I, I, I to introduce my guest. I, I got to set the stage for you here with me. As you are aware, I grew up in Dubai. We had one music channel, and that music channel uh, played a variety of music from I mean everything you other than rap. Uh, it was classical music in the mornings. Then there was uh, American Top 40 with Casey Kasem. And then in the evenings, it would be British pop. Um, and then if one of the shakes died or one of the, the uh, female ruling house members, it was like a week to a month, depending on their status, of just classical music. That was it. That was our only radio outlet in Dubai the entire time I was there. One English-speaking station. But we had TV shows, uh, mostly from Britain, that highlighted a lot of favorites. I was not into music at an early age other than classical music because I was a nerd. My sisters, however, my Lord, did they love the 80s. And now I am married to a woman who knows nothing but 80s music. My musical taste developed in the 90s when I moved back to the States. Pearl Jam, greatest band of all time. I don't care. You're wrong. Pearl Jam is the greatest. And I love modern rock. I love alternative My wife, however, musical taste, her it, it stopped after about 89 That is the last year that music was good for my wife. So in 1983, new radio station comes online in New York, Z100. They do something called the Morning Zoo. In fact, many stations around the country have shows they call the Morning Zoo or such. And my next guest, Scott Shannon, actually invented the format, started Z100, got it from worst to first in New York City in about 76 days. And pretty much every major artist from the 80s was pretty much discovered by Scott. And my wife has him to thank, and I have him to blame for my wife's musical tastes. Scott joins me. How are you? Hello, Eric. Uh, I uh, I asked my friend Sean Hannity about you. He neglected to tell me that you were on so many stages. I thought you were just on SB. <laughs> Excuse Surprise. me. That's all right. Yeah, and for those of you who don't recognize, uh, Scott is also the voice of Sean Hannity's show. <laughs> okay, I, Broadcasting okay. coast to coast. Hannity's on. on right now. My gosh, listen to that. Oh, all yeah, right. that's, my, that's my radio voice. I, I got to ask you, because I saw the documentary, Worst to First, and one of the th- the very first thing that, like, I was writing notes throughout because you know you and I we, we both know John McConnell who was involved with it, and and there's right. the, the in the trailer there's the thing about Madonna showing up and wanting. But the thing that caught me was the engineering. You wanted a sound, and it, it, radio stations across America today have a sound that they did not have in the 70s, and in large part, it was everybody mimicking the sound that you developed. And I didn't even know until I got into radio that you could modulate the sounds of hosts and the sound of the station coming through the speaker. Uh, it just so happens that there's a machine called the Vigilante, and uh, that almost every top 40 radio station, many talk stations in all formats, usually will have it in their equipment rack. And it was developed by a guy named Frank Foti. He happened to be our chief engineer when we signed on the air in New York in the summer of 1983. 
and he wanted to know if I had the, if the sound was correct. Yeah, I said, well, Frank, I, I need it a little bit louder. And I, so he'd go down, tinker around. Next day, he said, how does it sound? I said, it's loud enough. It sounds like it's jumping out of the radio. And then, Eric, I said, but you know, it's a little distorted. He said, well, when you turn it up loud like that, it's going to be distorted. I said, can't you divide? Can't you develop a box that will make it sound kind of nice and, and, and cool? He said, well, I'll try it. And that took a couple of days. And then again, I said, I want it to sound like kind of warm. It doesn't sound warm. It's loud and it's not distorted. I need it kind of warm. So he did it two or three more days. Now it's warm. It's loud and it's not distorted. Well, and he had a box for each one of these effects and which, which whatever needed done. One day I said, you know, you got too many boxes in that rack and you put them all together. <laughs> he said, I don't think so. He said, but I'll try. And that's where the vigilante box came from. Frank developed that and wanted to know if he could sell it to other stations. We said, sure, just not in New York. <laughs> and now he's a multi multi-millionaire. Because almost every you know good station in the world uses that box. He's got a couple of different versions of it, but you're right that it was very unusual for that time. Good grief! I just I, I never I fell into radio completely by accident. Uh, a local guy uh, down in Macon, Georgia, got arrested in a crack house. They needed somebody to fill in, and then the <laughs> folks at Cox Media heard me on the radio, thought it was my show, and offered me Herman Cain's job. And I, I had wow. no idea when I got into radio. All of this stuff amazed me. The technology. Now, one of the other things that caught my eye is you guys at, at the rise of this music station. And for folks listening, my wife in Middle Georgia, when I told her I was going to interview you, she's like Z one hundred, like yes. Yes, Z. I grew up overseas. She knows everything about '80s music, and you guys were buying records because they weren't sending you records. Well, the problem was, um, I came to New York, never having lived here. I'd only been a couple of times. I'm, I'm basically a Southern guy. I started in uh, Mobile. I wasn't from Mobile, but I started there, and I went to Memphis. Then I went to Nashville, and then I got brought into Atlanta. I worked at the uh, the original WQXI back in the 70s, QXI AM and FM. And, and, and then I just uh, it went on from there. But it was so different because the music was so important at that time, uh, Eric. You didn't have so many sources. Mm-hmm. And, and your wife, like myself, I, I'm a 60s baby. I was the same way, 60s and 70s, just like her. I really don't care much about the music after that. That was my sweet spot. <laughs> I had to work into the 80s because, you know, it was my job. But, uh, it, you know, when I was in Atlanta, we had Elton John came. He didn't live there then. He came by the radio station all the time. We had the Almond Brothers Band. Uh, I just liked to be involved with the music, and I think, it, I think it impressed the listeners that we knew the people who made the music. Well, you did. And, and I mean, so growing up, my, my sisters as well, they... Uh, Debbie Gibson, Madonna, Bon Jovi, Joan Jett, you name it. Uh, you knew all these people, many of them in the documentary. And uh, there's the story of Madonna just started showing up every day until you uh, promised her you'd play the record if she didn't keep showing up. Well, the funny, the, I, I, I jumped track for a second there. Uh, the weird part about it that, that I didn't really get into is the fact that this station was based in Secaucus. Right. I'd been now, there. There's it, nothing there. It, it, New Yorkers, I just might have not, I might as well have been in Dubai, where you're from, you know, because the record people, you couldn't get a taxi to go to Secaucus. Oh, we don't go to, we don't go to New Jersey. You know, Manhattan was a different animal. They had this very uh, kind of a snooty attitude. We're in the city. You're in New Jersey. Right. <laughs> and so, and, 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 and even the record people who wanted to bring records over to us, cabs didn't go there and they didn't drive a lot of people in new york don't drive so every week i would send our music director down to tower records back when they had record stores scattered around the metropolises 
and, and and he would pick up. I'd say, pick up this, pick up this one, get this uh, police record, and and he'd bring them by. And then we also would ask people uh, if there's a certain song that you'd like to hear, send us a copy of it, send us your album, and we'll try to play it. <laughs> so, and that was so weird because the radio people in New York at that time had this entitled, "We're New York, we do it different," and we came in and just blew the top off of it. Well, you did, and, and the rating spoke for for itself. Now, before I have to let you go, I, I want to ask you more, I guess, philosophically here, having done this, still involved in, in music and radio, you got the age of the streaming service, and I remember there was a, the iconic station in Atlanta when I was in college that did modern rock alternative it was 99X. And that was a you, great radio station, was. great program director, great staff. That was also a very iconic station. It was, and you could listen every day and discover songs you had never heard. And now it seems like radio is so addicted to playing what will re- register with Nielsen, you're never going to find new groups on the radio. You've got to go to Spotify or Apple Music and use an algorithm. And I, I would love to have a DJ I feel like i got a relationship with who's playing new songs I've never heard of that he knows I'm going to like. Well, the problem, the problem with that is so many people want to hear music they're familiar with. Not everybody is a, as adventurous as you are or willing to you know go through. the. And the, the other thing, too, is uh, it's, it's a me world now. They want to hear what they want to hear. They want to hear their unusual mix. I'm talking about they are listeners. Right. And and, and that's what's going on now. That's why you can make your own mix and you can hit reject or go on to the next one. Everything has changed. So how do you see the future then in in traditional radio as as so many people move to digital? Let me tell you, it all it all. Well, look what you're look what you've done in a short period of time. It all depends on the personalities on the radio and the content. It's mm-hmm. suddenly become a content business because you go to different cities, all the stations sound the same. You go to Atlanta, you go to Macon, you go to Mobile, you go to Chicago. You, it, it, the music's the same. The station's got the same slogans. They got the same contest. They all want you to go, you know, to and, and sign up on social media. It's different, you know, but it's mm-hmm. all about the friends that they make on the radio. That, yeah, I think that's a fair point. Okay, so uh, last question before I have to let you go here. I, I would be remiss if I did not mention Elvis Duran, who uh, collaborated on this documentary. And yep. to some degree now, is, is, is you were at Z100, and now he is. And y'all are, to a degree, competitors, but also um, have, have helped produce this great documentary together. And Z100 continues to be an iconic radio station, something you built uh, I always admire people, frankly, Scott, who can build something great and see it not fall apart when they walk away. Well, that's all in the design. It was built. It was built to last. I was known as a have gun, will travel kind of programmer, and I'd love to challenge. I hardly stayed anywhere more than two to three years. I stayed in uh, in Atlanta for two and a half years, fixed the station, and moved on. And, uh, and, and, and and that's just what I did. In this situation, this film has a couple of different lessons. Number one, build it to last. But most importantly, uh, if you want something to succeed, hire the right people and leave them the hell alone. Amen to that. My gosh, there's so much tinkering these days from senior management yeah. and radio companies around How many people came into you when you first started in radio, started your career? How many people came in and told you what you were doing wrong? <laughs> All of them, and I still ignore them. <laughs> you know, you look at the greats. Rush Limbaugh got fired from his first five radio jobs. Right. Howard Stern got fired six or seven times because they wanted to change those guys. Yeah, you know, um, so when when I got started, uh, Rush was a, a friend and mentor, and he told me I needed a, a designated a hole uh, that no one in radio will tell you you suck until they cancel you. So have somebody who can tell you you suck in advance, so you have time to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great line. He was 
he was uh, he also loved music. I mean, he, he was a he was a, a, a really a, he's like your wife. He was a child of the '80s. He loved '80s music. Yeah, he did. He told me that my musical taste sucked. That I, I needed to just listen to my wife. <laughs> the movie is worst of first. The true story of Z100. We call it a David and Goliath story. And it's available now on pre-order on Apple TV, Google Play, and Friday uh, it drops completely. You can get video on demand. It's a great movie. I think you'll love it no matter what you're interested in. But if you like radio, there's some really good lessons in it. And I thank you for having me. Scott Shannon, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for being with me. Scott Shannon started Z100 in New York. The movie the documentary is out this week, Apple TV and the like. You can get it. Worst to first, the true story of Z100 New York. You know, it just, I watched it and it was a, uh, I guess, flashback to a period of my life where I was not in the country. And then I tell my wife about it. She knows all the musicians. She, she's heard of the station. She knows the branding. If you've ever had a morning station anywhere in the country that had something that you would call the morning zoo, you have it because of what Scott Shannon did. Uh, with Z100 in New York. Hello there, it is Eric Erickson here. I want to go back to the phones, 877-973-7425. Marcus, you are going to be up next. Welcome. Hello, how you doing, Eric? Great, how are you? Um, I, I'm pretty good. I was just wanting to bring up a point about diseases coming up out of Mexico, and, you know, abroad as well. Mm-hmm. Coming in from other countries, Mexico, cholera, potentially Ebola. I mean, shouldn't that worry us more than just the COVID and or the, you know, the, well, people well, it, it, you know, the board, you, you raise a great point there. Yes, um, the, the number of diseases that are coming up out of Mexico, particularly from countries that have lower vaccine rates than us for a lot of these issues and the national security issues as well. We have found people. It has now been thoroughly documented. We have found people uh who are from Ukraine and from Russia from the Middle East who are flying to Mexico and paying people to get them across the American border it's a national security issue and to Marcus's point cholera is a big issue Ebola not so much because of the way Ebola transmits and and, and travels makes it very very hard uh to be transported and, and get to a place like us uh but uh cholera is one of them uh, meningitis is a big one uh, that has been found. Uh, and what else? There are a couple of others I, I've read. Um, 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 yellow fever has come, uh, people with yellow fever, and there was one other one. Uh, now it, it escapes me. But it's a problem in addition to COVID and, of course, all the different COVID strains. You know, we had the, what was it, the Lambda strain in South America that uh, cropped up here a little bit. It was overshadowed by Omicron. These are actually real concerns, in addition to the terrorism concern. If you will recall, just a couple of years ago, the uh, Border Patrol and Homeland Security arrested three uh, men from the Middle East who came into the country via our open border in Mexico who intended to launch terrorist attacks. It was fundamentally amazing to me how so much of the American media chose to ignore the story. We talked about it here. It was during the Trump administration, and Trump used it to highlight the need for a secure border, but so much of the media is so antagonistic towards the idea of a secure border, they totally ignored the story. There are three Middle Eastern men from Yemen in prison in the United States who came across the border to launch a terrorist attack. They were caught, thank goodness. But how many haven't been? That's the question. And that should give us all concerns. It really should. Now, some of you have bigger concerns. What are you going to do this weekend when you have a giant football game and a bunch of people coming over to your house and you're stressed out about what you're going to make for them? I have a solution. Omaha Steaks. I'm not kidding. Serious. You get a pile of burgers, a pile of hot dogs. You get a pile of caramel apple tartlets. You can grill the burgers and the gourmet jumbo franks. You get the caramel apple tartlets. And you're set. Now, right now, if you go to omahasteaks.com and you put Eric in the search bar, you can see the available packages. They have some incredible savings. And you get four free chicken breasts and four free pork chops, boneless pork chops. And then you get the burgers. You get the gourmet jumbo fries. You get the caramel apple tartlets. You get so much more. Uh, You know, they've got a football package in there where you can get wings as well. They've got great wings and they're already cooked. All you got to do is warm them up and they're great. I've had them. 
You go to omahasteaks.com. You put Eric, E-R-I-C-K, in the search bar, and you will see the incredible package, the incredible savings, and not only that, the four chicken breasts, boneless, skinless, and the four boneless pork chops that you get. I got a great recipe coming out um, on the recipe list for the boneless pork chops. But nonetheless, go to omahasteaks.com today. Put Eric in the search bar. Save. You got the big football game coming up. You got all your family and friends coming over. You can get great deals from Omaha Steaks and make it real easy to take care of them all. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877 877- 97 Eric 8779737425 I have to go where others may fear to tread I have a question I got a question When is it okay to be a racist I mean is it okay to sometimes treat different people differently based on their race? Is is it okay? Um, I don't want anyone to think I'm endorsing racism, but isn't it okay sometimes to say, well, uh, you're a minority and we don't want you in our school? Isn't it okay? It's what Harvard's doing, and the left seems to be okay with it. According to lawsuits, Harvard discriminates against Asians. According to MSNBC, experts say framing affirmative action as anti-Asian bias is dangerous. It's an old tactic in white supremacy that should not be allowed to succeed, except Harvard is saying if you're Asian, you're not going to get in. Uh, According to one website, here's the headline, actually race-conscious admissions are good for Asian Americans to be discriminated against. According to BBC, Harvard University does discriminate against Asian Americans. So we've gone from it's not really happening to it's happening, but it's no big deal to it's a good thing, actually, to why are people freaked out about Harvard discriminating against Asian Americans? Some of you think racism's okay if it benefits you. This is my problem with affirmative action. When you have a, an open affirmative action program, how do you know the person who got in is really qualified? How do you know the person who has the job is really qualified? When you are discriminating against Asians at Harvard, and first you deny it, and then you say, well, okay, we're doing it, but it's actually a good thing. Aren't you saying racism is good because you are specifically targeting a race? And then you say, no, 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 actually, actually, it's it's ethnicity. No, no, the hell it's not. What Harvard is doing is essentially saying that uh, Asian Americans are academically more gifted than all the other races. And so if all the Asian American students applied to Harvard, Based on their academics, uh, you'd have to let them all in at the expense of everyone else. And we can't have all those Asians at Harvard now. I mean, that's racism. It It, it is racism. It is uh, treating a race differently. If all the Asian American kids applied to Harvard, they would be ahead of the white kids, the black kids, the Hispanic kids. And you would have to let them in first based on merits. Why not? Why not if they apply, let them in on the merits? Shouldn't that then be an incentive for all the other kids? Except Harvard, of course, does prioritize legacies. So the white, Hispanic, or black kid whose dad was able to get into Harvard would have precedence over the Asian-American kids. Well, then doesn't that set up American aristocracy? 
So you're discriminating one way or the other. The, the question is discrimination. It's like, for example, I know people who refuse to eat at Chick-fil-A. I know people who actually get upset. I actually worked for a company where an employee complained to the human resources department that they were having a free chicken biscuit day because those biscuits reeked of homophobia. That's right. The chicken biscuit was a bigot. And the employee was horrified, horrified, appalled, and offended that they would allow a chicken biscuit into the office that was a bigot. Wasn't that employee discriminating? Wasn't that employee discriminating? I mean, his argument was that uh, the Kathy family are Christians. And the Kathy, Kathy family has supported Christian organizations in the past, and some of those Christian organizations have not been so down with the non-biblical sexual ethics. And therefore, he was opposed to going to Chick-fil-A. Now, I got a friend of mine who was gay who would eat at Chick-fil-A every single day of the week and said uh, maybe that will make him straight, but it's okay because he loves his chicken sandwich more than he loves his partner. But then you got these other people who they won't eat at Chick-fil-A because the Kathy's are Christians. Is that discrimination? Now, you could say it's their individual choice. That's true. It is their individual choice. It's also Harvard's individual choice to discriminate against Asian Americans. The difference is you don't get federal funds and Harvard does. And if you get federal funds, you can't discriminate. But Harvard has chosen to discriminate. And we've gone from denying it to now saying it's okay. But, you know, there, there, there is something more here. There is something more we, we need to figure out here. Um, is it okay for you to have preferences? What if those preferences are race-based preferences? Should you not? Do you? It might be more complicated than some people think. It might be. And who is society to impose society's view on you? Well, society is all of us and uh, what is good for all of our society. And I got to think it's not good for our society to have a bunch of citizens who are second-class citizens. It is also not good of society to decide to value or devalue someone based on the color of their skin. We've been through this before. It doesn't work out so well. Perhaps we should just get over the idea of affirmative action and make people valuable on their merits. But, you know, there's a problem with that. Schools. Y'all, there are a lot of good private schools in this country and a lot of good public schools in this country, and there are a lot of bad, bad schools. You know, in Atlanta, where I am, a lot of the public schools have gotten rid of their mask mandates, except in progressive enclaves. But my gosh, there are some private schools in Atlanta that will not give up the masks. Despite the science, despite the falling COVID, despite all of that, they're not giving up their masks. Woodward, one of the biggest private schools in the nation, uh, the biggest in the Southeast, for sure. It's refusing to give up its masks. The, the administration there is pretty woke. Uh, they will not let go of masks, but they're not, the only, they're not the only private school in the state that won't let go of their masks. Meanwhile, others have. The United States right now is seeing a uh, massive, massive decline in COVID, a 63% decline. And yet, some people can't let go of the masks. But some people, it's amazing what some people can't let go of. Some people can't let go of the past. They cling to the past with the same fear that these private schools cling to masks. You can't move on from that which paralyzed you. You can't move on from prior history. And 
our inability to move forward causes us problems. Our inability to recognize there needs to be change causes us problems. With masks, there's a psychological, mental, emotional toll taken on children. In failing public schools where you won't let the kids out, uh, what you're doing is you're continuing to drag poor kids down, and a lot of times those are minority kids. And then you say, well, we should all have merit-based hirings. Well, how can someone who went to a poor, failing school have any merit whatsoever to get into the job unless you discriminate against the more successful people? You know, the solution, it would seem to all of this, would be to improve the schools and let the parents take their kids out of schools that are failing and put them in better schools. I suspect in some of these private schools where the masks mandates won't come down because the administration is scared of a virus they can't control, you're going to have parents in a revolt. But the parents whose kids are stuck in public schools can't revolt. The public schools are the most racist institution in the United States of America by default because the schools are overwhelmingly assigned and designed around zip codes where people live and people tend to live among their own kind, whether it's white, black, rich, poor, you name it. And so those schools reflect their neighborhoods, except in areas of gentrification, unless you go through busing and you shuffle kids all over God's good earth in the name of giving them an education, and then you set them up to fail by forcing them to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to drive halfway across the town and be there by 8 o'clock in the morning so that they can get fed and get an education and then put them on a bus and send them two hours back home where they're exhausted, tired, hungry, and you expect them to do all their homework and perform. Why not give the parents a choice? Why not go back to neighborhood schools? Why not allow people a leg up? Part of the issue as well is family. We have, of course, as a nation, devalued family for a very long time. Who needs a mom and a dad when you've got Uncle Sam's man boob? He'll take care of you. Uncle Sam will provide you your income. Uncle Sam will provide you your food. Uncle Sam will provide you your education. Uncle Sam will these days also provide you with your phone and your crack pipe. Real wholesome values there from Uncle Sam. And we wonder about the collapse of families. We wonder about kids' inabilities to get ahead. And so then what do we do? We come up with more discrimination. We've discriminated against these families by refusing to allow them to get out and decide their own future for themselves to take destiny into their hands. And so then we prop up even more discrimination against them and say, hey, now we're going to cast doubt on your overall academic success by creating an affirmative action program where you, based on the color of your skin, will be given a leg up that others will not. And so in perpetuity, people will question your competence and merit for getting it and presume you got it because of the color of your skin. And that stigma will live all on top of you as you do your job. Maybe we should just go back to, to square one and, and ground zero and say, let's commit to rebuilding families and letting moms and dads control their kids' education and move them where their kid will get the best fit, maybe have some neighborhood schools, and then maybe see if we can get these kids through 12 years of education to get into college, not to have the college prioritize the kids who came before and prop up their own aristocracy, but give the kids based on merit a leg up and those who need some extra time, get them some vocational correction help so they can get into their education. Or maybe tell these kids you don't even need a college education because you can get a well-paying job right now uh, by using your brains, your hands, your feet, and so much more. Maybe we should rethink how we're doing all of this together. Instead, we're going to have a group of people who still think masks are necessary. Also think it's necessary to tell Asian kids you're not welcome here because of the color of your skin. And you really think we're going to get racism eradicated in the United States doing that? Really? One of the groups that fights for the conservative cause, including an end to these affirmative action nonsensical programs, is called 
Patriot Mobile, their cell phone provider. Now, how do they do it? Well, they take a portion of their profits and they donate to the conservative movement, to the Second Amendment movement, to the pro-life movement. They use their funds to match their values and their values are Christian and conservative and they need you as a customer to help them and together you can fight for what's right in this country. The way you do it is you just go to patriotmobile.com slash Eric. PatriotMobile.com slash E-R-I-C-K. You get free activation with my name. Not only that, you can carry your phone number over or you can get a new phone number. Now, I've got two lines that I use. I have one that's my private number and then I've got my public number. And I use Patriot Mobile so that I can gauge the coverage. And I can tell you, it's as good as, if not better than what I've got. And you get 5G, you get data, you get voice, you get all of that at a very reasonable price point. And you get greater discounts the more lines you add. If you've got a large family, you need multiple lines, they're a really good fit for you. You can also call them at 972-PATRIOT, 972-PATRIOT. Tell them I sent you, you get free activation, you get these great discounts, and you commit to a company that's committed to your values and then puts its money where its mouth is and fights for those values. PatriotMobile.com slash E-R-I-C-K. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. To the phones, Rooster, you're going to be up next. Welcome. Hi, Eric. How are you, my friend? Good afternoon to you. Oh, I'm doing well down here in Athens, just just driving around, doing my job. Great. Uh, I I was going to make a comment. I was listening to you talk about Harvard and them not accepting uh, applicants because of the race. And one of the things I've noticed around, and not many people talk about it, is the fact that a lot of people are being taught to be victims, and then whenever you cross a line with them, whatever it might be, they cry racism. So, for example, let's say, for example, I'm an ethnicity that my boss is not, doesn't share. And then for some reason I mess up in my job and I get fired. Well, because he's not my race and I've been taught that that race doesn't like my race. Well, he just did something that is racist toward me. Right. Not that it was or wasn't. It's a fact that I'm, oh, I'm looking for it. I'm waiting for racism. Oh, that yeah. Whether it's true or not. I mean, is some people, not only do they want to be victims, they want to be offended, uh, and then they want to scream about their offense. Uh, we see this more and more across the board. I mean, look at the people who are upset with Joe Rogan. They're just looking for something to be offended with the guy. Uh, and then when you bring race into it, it, it becomes even more so. But, I mean, you think race is bad. Rooster, thanks for the phone call. you got to listen to this story. Uh, Adele, you know, the singer Adele. Adele is being attacked because she went to an awards show, uh, the Brit Awards. She was named Artist of the Year, a newly created category that merged the Best Male and Best Female Artist Awards. And she says, I understand why the name of this award was changed, but I really love being a woman. And I love being a female artist. I do, she said to massive cheers in the crowd. She says, I'm really proud of us. I'm really, really proud of us. But there was outrage. Online outrage. They wanted to be offended. One said, I've lost respect for Adele. Because she dared, dared to be proud of being a woman when the genders should no longer matter. A gender-neutral award show, they said, by merging male and female artists. Gender-neutral. And she said she was proud to be a woman. And they're like, oh, please, please don't be like J.K. Rowling. You know, they've canceled J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling, who sold the Harry Potter books, they had to cancel her. I heard someone say God himself probably had something to do with it because he was worried that Harry Potter sales might surpass the Bible. I, I This outrage machine, you want to be outraged by stuff. And then the media sees your tweets and decides, oh, there's a news story because five people are outraged. It's 2022. Things are still crazy. Things haven't settled down. And now you got the Federal Reserve and interest rates. You got the economy. You got inflation. A lot of banks won't even return your phone call. Let's say you're a small business and you need a loan for $750,000 or higher. 
you see an opportunity. We're banks. They don't even want to see you. You want to buy a building. You want to build a building. Reach out to the Frost family at First Liberty Building and Loan. They've been helping small businesses become big businesses since the 1990s. They want to help you if they can. So spend 10 minutes with them. See if you're a good fit for them and they're a good fit for you. Their website is firstlibertyga.com. That's firstlibertyga.com. Again, you need a loan, $750,000 or higher. You're a small business and you see an opportunity to grow. Share it with the Frost family and see if they can help you. Firstlibertyga.com. That's firstlibertyga.com. First Liberty Building and Loan can help businesses nationwide become bigger businesses.